My name is Mark Myers. I'm the author of the new book, Why Jazz Happened. In 1944 and 1945, at the start of bebop, a very small group of people who developed this music know how to play it. It's an, actually an intricate form of music. Um, what happens though is as they start to make records, other musicians who had no clue on how to record this music start to transcribe the records. And little by little, they're able to figure out how to play it. So that by the late 40s, 46, 47, 48, the marketplace is flooded with bebop music, so much so that even Benny Goodman, um, Artie Shaw, um, Harry James, Charlie Barnett, all of the so-called staid big swing bands from the 30s and early 40s now have figured out how to get arrangements written and how to play this new current form of music. So that by the late 40s, the form is almost exhausted, but what you see is this rise of new classical jazz. The musicians who had been in World War II come home, they're able to go to college for free under the GI Bill, and as a result, the GI Bill gives them the opportunity to become exposed to formal classical music. When they graduate from music schools in the late 40s, all of these musicians bring the modern classical form to jazz. They don't give up jazz and become classical musicians. It's much too difficult to become a classical musician and those seats are already taken in orchestras. But what they do do is they bring the modern classical form into jazz and you see this raising of the bar as more and more musicians have to write more complicated arrangements and they need to find musicians who can actually play what they've written. So jazz classical in the late 40s, um, parts of cool, um, other forms, uh, chamber jazz, come out of this highly trained uh, music mind um, that is coming out of the music schools at this time. In 1948, Columbia introduces the long playing record. And today that, that sounds almost absurd, it's almost quaint. But what you see um, at, during this period before the introduction of the long playing record, all you had in the marketplace uh, since the early 1920s, since the late teens actually, is a 78 RPM with only three minutes on each side of the record. But when Columbia releases the uh, long playing record in 1948, you suddenly can fit 30 minutes of music on each side. You see the introduction of a long playing record, and you also see the rise of magnetic tape, which starts to be used in record studios. Um, before the uh, introduction of magnetic tape, which was a basically a German technology that was picked up after World War II, prior to tape, it was Frankenstein's laboratory in most studios. There was chemical baths and metal plating and all kinds of things that went on in there, but with tape, you could suddenly record easily, you could splice and edit easily, and it made it much more cost efficient. So with the rise of the long playing record and with the rise of magnetic tape, record companies needed musicians. They needed more music to fill the greater amount of real estate that was on these discs. So you see the introduction of musicians who never would have had record contracts if these technologies hadn't been developed because record companies need more product. But you also see longer solos. The solos that had been played in nightclubs but couldn't fit on these three minute records suddenly have plenty of room. And record companies and producers are urging these musicians to go long, to extend their solos so that they could fill out the disc. For more information about my book, Why Jazz Happens, go to whyjazzhappened.com.